I guess I'll start um, since it's already seven o'clock. I'm sure we'll have a few more stragglers pop on. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Jane Eliasoff. I'm the director of the Mockler History Center. And I have completely lost count on how many of these programs we've done, um, lots. And if you've missed them and you'd like to find out more about them, um, you're welcome to go on our YouTube channel. Almost all of them have been put up on um, YouTube, except for the very first one, which I didn't even think to record. And then one of them, we had technical difficulties in the middle of last year. Uh, one of them I haven't gotten to yet, but all the rest of them are up there. So mm -hmm. uh, do take a look at them. There are plenty to uh, enjoy if you're not in the mood to stream Netflix anymore. Um, if you'd like to make a donation to the Montclair History Center, you know that those are always welcome as well. Um, you can... Um, uh, donate by uh, online at MocklerHistory.org. You can go on Zelle. You can go on Venmo just to look for Mockler History Center. My name will pop up, but that's the right place to be. And then um, you can write us a check the old fashioned way. Forgot about that. <laughs> so yeah, so you can write us a check. We always accept those. You know, and I've, you've heard me say this before, if you've been on these programs, the money is, is wonderful, but the kind words that everybody um, has been sharing along with that uh, has been really sustaining for us over the last year. Um, with that, I am going to start talking right away about our presentation since I have no one else to introduce but myself. And um, we're going to be talking tonight about uh, the Schultz family and house. Um, as you know, the Schultz House, or Evergreens as it's known, is located at 30 North Mountain Avenue. Um, and as you probably also know, uh, we made the difficult decision a couple of years ago that we needed to uh, move on from that house and have someone else become its stewards because we weren't doing it justice. And uh, went through a long process, but believe we have truly found the right people. It's a single family. Um, they love the house as much as we do. They are dedicated to its preservation as much as we are. Um, and so we're very excited about that. Let's move right along. Um, the Schultz house is the home, was the home of Charles Schultz. He has nothing to do with the Peanuts group, Charles Schultz, entirely different guy. He did marry a woman named Lucy, but that's as close as we get. He's the son of German immigrants. Um, he built the house in 1896. Um, he had a brick business. He had a building supply company. He was president of Hoboken Savings Bank for over 40 years. Um, he invested in railroads and he also um, was an amateur scientist. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the family first and then we're gonna move on to the house itself. Now, a lot of the information from what from the family uh, part of the presentation comes from a history that Molly's uh, Molly is the one who bequeathed the house to us back in 1996. Um, her aunt Emily used to read her stories all the time, and Molly one day asked her aunt to, to tell her their family story. And so, rather than just telling her, uh, Aunt Emily wrote it down in longhand in a book that we have, and it has been transcribed. And so much of what I'm telling you tonight comes from her transcription, from that transcription. In addition to that, uh, as we um, went through the items in the house, we brought back to our archives probably more than 60 boxes of archival material that includes letters and journals, albums, receipts, photos, lantern slides, you name it. Um, it's gonna take a year or more for us to cate uh, categorize. But the great thing about it is it, there were just, you really get a sense of the family through them. Because for example, on some of the receipts that Charles took on his round the world trip, in the little corner, he wrote things like nice view, bad food or something like that. So we really get a sense of the family through the archives and we're excited to learn more and more about them as we continue our exploration. This is the family tree that we're gonna work our way through. Um, it's four generations, Charles here and Lucy. Charles was the gentleman who built the house. Lucy was his wife. These three children uh, were really not children during uh, when they moved into the house. Two of them had grand or two of them had children. Uh, we're also gonna start a generation back with Hannah and John who are Charles's parents and Benjamin and Emily who are Lucy's parents. 
So we're gonna begin first with Hannah and John and Charles. Now, Hannah, uh, Charles's mother, was born in Germany in a small village on the main river. Uh, Emily said in her book, on November 30th, 1809, in the village of Altenkunstadt, about 20 miles from Bamberg in southern Bavaria, a newborn babe blinked up at the bearded face bent over her swaddling pillow. Fortunately, she was still too inexperienced to recognize the disappointment written on her father's features. He had hoped for a son to carry on his name and his business, and there was another girl when there already was Amelie to provide with a dowry. He sighed and turned, turning toward the bed said to his wife, well, we must take what God sends. Let us call her Hannah. Perhaps the next will be a boy. Now, Hannah's father was a wool merchant and his brother was a fur dealer. They travel from market to market, from fair to fair, buying uh, stacks of wool or, or fur skins and from the peasants. And then they would take them, they put them in the warehouse until they could sell them to wool merchants or furriers. Now, by the time Hannah was five, Emily notes, uh, she could knit a stocking. And that's important because of the story Emily's about to tell. It was well little Hannah could knit, she said. For that year, a terrible fire destroyed half the village. The row home and everything in it was burned. Hannah never forgot the terrifying flames driven by the wind from roof to roof, the frantic men passing buckets of water and dashing them in vain at the fire, the women rushing out with their arms full of clothing or bedding or standing in mute despair before the ruin of their homes. No one had time to think of their children, which I think is very funny. Today, that would never happen. A boy playmate seized Hannah's hand and cried, run Hannah, and together they sought refuge under the stone bridge, which had spanned the brook. There they crouched in terror until at last the raging flames had been checked and the mothers began to search for their kids. According to Emily, the Rao household was destroyed, but the warehouse was still full and neighbors helped neighbors and before the embers were cold, Frau Rao and her daughters were spinning, sewing and knitting to replace what had been lost. Uh, it, it, she goes on to talk about how Hannah, when she was an older woman, somebody said to her, Hannah, how come you never knit? And she said, I got so tired of knitting when I was a child, I want nothing to do with it today. Now, Hannah attended school. She excelled in arithmetic. And since her father never got the son he had wanted, she began to help him with his business. Uh, she went, and Emily goes on to talk about how the old wool merchant with the little rosy cheek maiden became well known throughout all of uh, Southern Bavaria. But one day, at the markets, she met a young man who was buying grains for the Bavarian army, and his name was John George Schultz, initially spelled with a C, but when they came to America, apparently we lost that C. Um, John had lost his parents as a child. Um, he and his brother, Charles, had been cared for by the older brother, Simon. Simon had gotten a good education already by the time his parents died, and so he became a tutor and used that money to care for John and Charles, his younger kids. He also brought them along with him on all of his lessons, and that's where John and Charles got their education. Now, when Hannah meets John, uh, sparks must have flown because Han Emily talks of their meeting in rich romantic overtones. She says, when Hannah first saw the young grain buyer, he was tall, erect, and vigorous with wavy black hair, bright blue eyes, ruddy cheeks, and strong white teeth, often revealed in a ready laugh. This portionless orf orphan had not, no right to raise his eyes to the daughter of a prosperous wool merchant, but when his merry glance met hers, Hannah's level head was turned. Despite her father's opposition, the two young people managed to meet wherever their business took them. Finally, Hannah threw prudence to the wind and promised to marry the homeless wanderer. Father Rao was furious, but Hannah stood firm. Suddenly, though, John finds himself out of a job because of a change in the government. So he tied his spare clothes in a red cotton handkerchief, got Hannah to promise she'd wait for him, and hightailed it to America. He wound up in Middletown, Connecticut, where he found work in a woolen mill and soon became a foreman there, saving his money to bring Hannah over. It took a long time, though. It took seven years before he finally had enough to bring her back. So during those seven years, Papa Rao back in Bavaria is not very pleased. And he's saying things like, I can imagine, Hannah, find yourself a good man, settle down. Your sister's already betrothed. She's got a wealthy man. What are you waiting for? Um, but he, uh, she was still committed to John in the United States. And even when John did send for her in 1837, Papa wasn't impressed. He kept saying that fellow's never gonna meet you. You'll be lost in that savage country. 
And I'm not giving you a dime, even if it doesn't work out to bring you back home. But a cousin who had settled in New Orleans was returning to America from a trip and he offered to take Hannah as far as New York, which was pretty darn close to Connecticut. And so she said, yes. Now, this is interesting. In contrast to uh, John and his red handkerchief, Hannah packed her a homespun linen in a wooden chest, her dishes in a hamper. She tied her three feather beds and her fat pillows and her hand quilted satin green coverlet. And she packed her dresses in a small trunk and with them all set out for the last time in the covered van to drive to Bamberg. And the cool thing is, we actually have found her green satin hand quilted coverlet. It's faded over the years, but it's 180 years old. So it's pretty darn cool that we um, actually still have that in our possession. So uh, despite Papa's predictions, John was waiting on the dock when her ship arrived along with his brother, Charles, who'd also immigrated to New York with him. Um, and Charles had started up a shoemaker shop on Greenwich Street, was living in New York City. So the uh, soon to be newlyweds stayed there overnight and then got married the next day and drove off to Middletown, Connecticut to start their new life together. Uh, less than a year later, Charles Schultz was born, the uh, man who built the house. Um, and then John decides that, you know what, I really would much prefer to be a farmer and a landowner than working in a mill. So they bought property out in Rhodes Hall, New Jersey, which is basically out in the South Brunswick area. And he became a farmer and he opened up a general store. They had several more children. They had George, Caroline, known as Carrie, Sophia or Soph, and Rosalia or Rose. Um, and they lived a very nice life out in Road Hall. Um, I imagine Hannah probably lived a life much like women of that period where she was working a lot, cooking, cleaning, helping with the farm. She probably was sewing a lot and um, not knitting, but to the chagrin of her small daughters, she'd buy a whole bolt, a bolt of calico, according to Emily and make the three of them dresses off of it until it was all used up. So the girls just kept getting dresses with the same fabric and they probably all matched. Um, they were not happy about it, but the little scraps went into patchwork quilts. And lo and behold, we found one of those too. This was hidden in a under a mattress in the attic and it had been undisturbed for probably more than 120 years. Now, meanwhile, John's brother, Charles, who he come over with, had moved from grocery store or from shoemaking to grocery store. And his store was close to the Hudson River. And a lot of his customers were coming from the ships and the barges that were docked there. Um, and some of them were brick, they would buy bricks up in Haverstraw, New York, and they'd come back and they would keep the bricks on their boats until they had sold them. Well, Charles saw an opportunity. And he began to accept the bricks in exchange for the stuff in the grocery store. Uh, he began to stockpile bricks. And so he started a brick business. And pretty soon the brick business swallowed up the grocery business. And over time, he became one of the leading brick commission dealers in New York City. And that's how the Schultz brick business was formed. Now, just a point of interest, and this isn't mentioned by Emily, but I question and wonder whether or not Hannah and John might have been Jewish. By the mid 1800s, about half the population in Altenkunstadt was Jewish and the name Rao, often spelled with an H at the end, um, was a surname that was associated with Jewish families in that community and in Southern Bavaria. Uh, the famed Jewish philanthropist, Julius Rosenwald actually married, his second wife was a Rao. Um, and so there were a lot of Rao, there was also a uh, Chicago philanthropist whose last name was Rao, who was uh, Jewish. So we found this stick in the house and one side of it says ego, alpha and omega. I am the alpha and omega, first and the last beginning and end from the book of Revelations, which is very Christian. Yet the other side, we have two Jewish stars, the word Agla, A-L-G-A, -A, um, and the word Tetragrammaton, which you don't see here. So I did some research because, of course, I know nothing about this. Tetragrammaton is the four letters in Hebrew that spell out Yahweh or God. And Agla in Hebrew is actually um, an acronym for a line in a daily prayer, the A-G-L-A. -A. Now, 
What makes this even more intriguing is that the acronym was reinterpreted by the Germans um, as a as um, for something that says Almighty God extinguished the conflagration and was used as a talisman against fire. Um, we found this on the very top cabinet in one of the rooms on the third floor of the Schultz house, also undisturbed like that, like that quilt for more than 100 years. Could it have been Hannah? Um, and then following up with that, we found this um, small doll bed in the attic, and it too has a Jewish star on it. So we probably will never know the answer to this. But could Hannah, uh, just as she adopted English as her primary tongue when she came over to America, could she have adopted the Christian religion as well? We'll probably never know, but this is her obituary that appeared in 1901 in the Monmouth document, Democrat. And it says she was a true Christian and for many years had been a member of the Jamesburg Presbyterian Church. Just a point of interest. We're going to move on to Charles Schultz, who built the house. Um, he's sort of our central character and whom everything off of him sort of falls either before or after him. Um, he was a delicate child, as Emily said. He had rickets when he was young, and then at age 12, he developed rheumatism. He attributed both of them to drink and coffee as a young child and swore off of coffee for himself and also refused to let his kids ever drink it either. Now, this was during the heyday of hydropathy which was an alternative medicine that believed that running water or water therapy could cure muscular issues. So the summer of rheumatism, when he was 12 years old, he spent the entire summer with his feet in the running brook uh, down in Road Hall. Um, and it ultimately brought back the use of his feet, whether it was that or time, we don't know, but nonetheless, um, he did know though that farming was not for him. Uh, so at 14, he got his first job in a store that wasn't his own family's. He got it in New Brunswick and then soon went to work as a clerk in New York City at Lord & Taylor's. Now, at the time, there were very, very long working days, and uh, being a clerk, a sales clerk, was always considered man's work because a woman could never have stood on her feet as long as a man could. Uh, so he became part of a group called the Dry, clerk, Dry Goods Clerks Early Closing Association, catchy name, that uh, advocated and actually successfully advocated for shorter working hours. At night, he attended Cooper Institute and attended classes. It was there he developed a lifelong love of physics and astronomy. And then the Civil War broke out. But because he uh, had so many ailments, he wasn't able to serve. So instead, he became a constable um, And during the time of the Copperhead riots in New York. Um, but then he began to get a cough, and it turned out that he had tuberculosis. So he uh, resigned his jobs. Uh, he packed up his bucks, and he heads back to the farm to recuperate. Um, and at the farm, he uh, not only regained his strength, his strength, but also met the love of his life, Lucy Budd. And so now we are going to talk about Benjamin Budd and Emily Stout, who were Lucy's parents. So Lucy is his wife, um, and we're going to kind of go back in her lineage a little bit. Um, their ancestry goes much further back than the Schultz's ancestry in America. Um, the Buds hail from Somerset, England, where they were persecuted because they were Quakers. When William Penn got his charter in the late 1600s, they followed him over and settled in Burlington County near Mount Holly. Um, some stayed there. Um, some went to New York and Long Island. Um, and others settled throughout New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And actually, Bud Lake is named for John Bud, one of its earliest settlers. We have to pass down several generations before we get to Benjamin Budd, who was born in 1813. Now, Ben uh, was the son of a physician and the grandson of a physician, and he had planned to follow in their footsteps. But after a year or two of study, he decided he needed a quicker way to make money. And the reason was this. He'd driven to Kimberton, Pennsylvania to escort his sister Mary home from boarding school and he fell in love at first sight with his sister's schoolmate, Emily Stout. His mother gave him part of his patrimony. He was able to start up a general store in Mount Holly with it. And so he and Emily were able to get married. Now the Stout lineage also goes back to the 1600s in America. Emily's father was also a physician. His name was Abram. Um, his, her mother was Maria, Anna Maria Minor. And the miners came to America in 1629, settling in Charleston, Massachusetts. Uh, by the time we get to Emily's, Dr. Abram Stout and Anna Maria Miners, they're living in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. 
Now this sampler uh, is in the Schultz family collection that we've retained. I believe that Mary Miners, who you can see up here, Mary Miners worked this in her 10th year. We believe that Mary Miners may have been Anna Maria's uh, younger sister. The parents were Asher Minor and Mary Minor. And you can see down here, we have Asher Minor, Mary Minor. 1830 was probably the year that she uh, did the, uh, the work. Now, they, uh, Emily was born in 1820. Uh, she was married when she was not yet 18 in, eight, in January 1837. Um, what I get a kick out of with the Next Generation Emily's uh, book on this um, is that she goes into real detail about some things, all about what this woman's uh, wedding dress looked like. But my favorite part of that story was she talks about how um, she had little heelless taffeta slippers made to match her gown, but couldn't wear them on her wedding day because on New Year's Day, the engaged couple had gone sleigh riding and she'd stayed out so long that her feet were frozen and swollen. So she had to wear just her regular old shoes on her wedding day. They went to Bud Lake for the honeymoon to stay that summer with a relative. And Emily tells the story that as they drove along, they came upon a clump of white everlasting by the wayside. The bridegroom stopped his horse and leaping down, gathered a bunch um, of the plant. He presented it to his lady with a pretty speech about the how it is a symbol of his everlasting devotion to her. She pinned the flowers to her bonnet, wore them there all summer long and treasured the memory the rest of her life. And clearly she must have because we're still learning about it almost 200 years later. Now they had uh, several children. Um, eight to be exact, and Lucy was smack in the middle. They settled in a, a, out near Fresh Ponds in near South Brunswick as well, and they called their little homestead Woodside. Uh, like Charles, whom she'd one day marry, she got sick as a child. She was two when she developed infant paralysis. Now, if you remember, her, her mother was, or her grandmother was a um, married to a physician. So they packed her up, sent her to Pennsylvania, and her grandmother cared for her for her first or for about a year, uh, ultimately regaining until she regained her strength. Um, but for the rest of her life, she was never able to raise her arm above uh, the right arm above her shoulder. When she was healthy, she returned to French Fresh Ponds, went to school there, and the Bud children and the Schultz children sort of intermingled. Um, her parents, as a as an older as a young woman, her parents died within two years of each other. She was 18 when her dad died and, and 20 when her mother died, um, which really was a blow to the family. The children were scattered. Um, Woodside was sold. Lucy winds up in the home of a distant relative uh, caring for an elderly woman, but it's really a sad time for her. And then one day, um, um, uh, Charles's father, John, uh, said uh, he has a son-in-law named Conover and Conover said to her, you know, Charlie Schultz would give his two eyes for you. So Charlie had been at home because Charles Schultz had been at home recuperating from tuberculosis. And so he begins an intense courtship with Lucy um, through letters because he then moved back into New York City. Um, and he even sent her the uh, poems from Wordsworth. Uh, Wordsworth had written a series of five poems called the Lucy Poems, and he underlined her name in all of them. Um, I, we haven't found those letters, although I hope that somewhere in those 60 boxes we find at least one of them. She consented to marry him, and her engagement ring was a single pearl. They were married on May 6th. 1868 in a small ceremony and it finally broke her from her black morning attire. As she actually tells a story or Emily tells a story about how when she was going away her dress was green which was her favorite color but she saw a woman in a mirror reflected wearing green and she actually didn't recognize it as herself because she was so used to seeing herself in black. Now the previous year uh, Charles's father had let him and Conover, the guy who was the matchmaker in this whole deal, to buy a building material business. Um, they became not only business partners, but they moved in together with their new wives. Well, that didn't work out real well. Um, Conover soon realized commerce wasn't for him, and so he bought a farm near Trenton. 
Charles then picked up another partner. His name was Mr. Morton, uh, but Morton preferred yachting to working. And one night, uh, late in the night, his yacht capsized and he died. Charles bought him out, um, renamed the company, and then helped Mrs. Morton with her business affairs until her sons were old enough. Now, they begin to have children, and so the little house that they were in was not working anymore, and so they buy a house on um, uh, first at 234 Bloomfield Street with Lucy's inheritance, and then they move again to 826 uh, Hudson Street, which is pictured here, thank you, Zillow, um, with a brownstone, it's a brownstone, Lucy des or Emily describes it as a brownstone with black walnut do doors. Every bit of material that went into it was the best. And today it's divided up into apartments that you can purchase if you'd like for about $1.5 million. So now we're gonna go to the next generation, the children that Charles and Lucy have. And this is where we begin to get a little confusing with names because we have a lot of repetition with Emily's and we'll have repetitions with Charles's as well, but let's try this and move right on. First child is Emily Bud Schultz. She is our chronicle, our family history chronicler. She was born in 1872 and she was supposed to be named jo Johanna for John and Hannah but Hannah thought that that was an ugly name and urged her to name her after Emily, um, her other grandmother instead. Um, Emily's grandfather, Schultz, says to his um, son, if it's a boy telegraph, it's a girl right. So I guess some things hadn't changed in a number of years. Emily attended Miss Matilda Schmidt's Young Lady School in Hoboken and then went off to college, which is remarkable for that period. Um, she went to Wellesley, graduating there in 1894. Um, following graduation, uh, she takes a two-month trip to Europe with her father. They visited Germany, Switzerland, France, and England. During that trip, I believe that Charles went back to Alten Kunstadt, but Emily did not accompany him to that uh, on that little diversion. I believe she stayed in Berlin. Now, just as a point of reference, Emily was 24 years old when Evergreens was completed and they moved in. Um, when they did get to Montclair, she quickly became involved in a number of activities, including the Montclair College Women's Club. She was treasurer of Mountainside Hospital, which was originally run by women. Um, she was involved in the Montclair Equal Suffrage League. And I even had a call from a researcher once who had found her name among other women who were corresponding with women from the Soviet Union in an attempt to create a thaw in the Cold War through the female uh, persuasion. She also loved to travel, usually with her college roommate, Sarah Burroughs, who lived at the house on and off throughout the years. And we have an amazing journal that she wrote in our archives in which she transports us to 1906 England, or Edwardian England, in which we see the countryside through her eyes. Now, interestingly, um, both Emily and Lucy suffered from deafness. And Lucy began to lose her hearing shortly after Emily was born and became more and more of a recluse. Um, Emily began to lose her hearing after she got back from Wellesley. And so um, the, the both women um, had this same affliction. We don't know if it was genetic or whether it was just you know coincidence. But with that, oh, and the one other thing I wanna mention about her is that when she did move into Evergreens because Lucy was so ill, Emily really took over as the um, woman of the house there. Second child is Walter. Now, Walter Schultz was born in 1874. Um, two years later, Grandpa Schultz didn't get a chance to see that he finally had that grandson he was looking for because he had died during uh, Lucy's pregnancy. He was described as a beautiful fair child with blue eyes and pale gold curls. He went to school primarily in Hoboken before going to Columbia Institute in New York City. Uh, when they moved to Montclair, he was 22 years old and he was sort of known in the family as Old Faithful. He became the rock of the family, taking care of ill family members and ultimately succeeding Charles in the family business when he became too ill to be there year round. <clears throat> Uh, as he got older, he uh, fell in love with a woman named Anna Livese, I believe it's pronounced. Um, in 1908, they were married, but she was a Quaker woman whose father, daughter of a, um, a blacksmith, and her father was widowed, and she didn't want to leave her father. 
So um, Walter bought the little plot of land that was behind Evergreens that's connected by a driveway that you can still see right there. And uh, he built the house um, that is there uh, still today. And it was also built by Michelle Lebrun, who is the man who designed Evergreens, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, anyway, Walter uh, bought the plot of land, built the house, and on June 28th, 1908, they, they were married at her father's house, and within a few weeks, Anna's father comes to live with them, um, and his greatest consolation, according to Emily, was the forge, which Walter had installed in the cellar of their new home. So I wonder if that, uh, if that forge is still there, and if anybody ever gets a chance to go into that house or lives in that house, please let me know. Um, he died of cancer four years later. Uh, Walter, as I mentioned earlier, took over the building supply business and um, uh, really worked that for most of his life. And the third child is Clifford Glenmore Schultz. He was born a little bit later in 1882. He died in 1967. Um, he too attended school in um, Hoboken, but then he went off to the Montclair Academy um, and then Princeton University. It was during Charles' visits to see Clifford at the Montclair Academy that he really began to like Montclair and decided that this is where he wanted to build his house. Just as a point of reference, again, Clifford is 16 years old when the family moves to Montclair. He goes off to Princeton, but never graduates because um, he became ill. Now, Clifford, um, uh, Clifford in 1905 went down to Charleston with his friend from school. Um, he met a woman named Florence O'Neill, who was known as Ponce. Um, she was the second of nine children of Henry J. O'Neill and Marianne Baker. Um, uh, Marianne was Irish, German, and French, and Emily writes that Florence combined the French grace of bearing, dexterity of hand, and eye for beauty with the Irish tact, quick-wittedness, and courage. Um, they were married at 43. I said it was Legary Street, but today I was corrected, but I can't remember how they pronounced it, Legro Street in Charleston. Um, they came back to Montclair and created an apartment for themselves on the third floor of the Schultz house. Um, there's a master bedroom and a sitting room and a bedroom for their little daughter, Marion, or Molly, as she was known, who arrived in 1906. Um, after Ponce arrives, Emily begins going away for the summers, uh, leaving for the first time in 1906 on that trip to England. Now, I don't know whether this was just because Emily now felt free that she no longer had to run the house year round, or whether it was because there was a tension with two women um, sort of running the house and vying for women of the house together. We might never know on this one either, um, but um, it, it is very clear that she goes away almost every summer uh, after Florence or Ponce moves in. Now, Ponce was lonely. Uh, she'd come from a large family and Montclair uh, really wasn't a match for the Charleston Society and for her large and lively family. Um, and so during the summer months when Emily went away, Ponce's sisters would come up and visit her and stay in the house with her. Clifford worked for bid in the bond business, then he ran a machine shop, which I'll talk about in a little bit later, and then he went into the family masonry business. She died in 62, and as I said, he died in 1967. Now, I also have to mention Jack. Uh, before Emily is born, uh, Charles and Lucy hear a whimpering at the door. It was a little yellow puppy. A neighbor had turned him out in the cruel wind and rain. As Emily says, they took him in and he grew to be the most intelligent dog and a beauty too, with fine plumy tail and lovely dark eyes. He learned to speak for his food, shake hands, play dead and other tricks. Now, clearly this isn't Jack, but he's cute. So I put him in. And as we sorted through the items in the house, we found dog tags and collars. And um, we even found this little doggy family tree in the house. So clearly Jack started a long time love affair with dogs. Now, during this whole period, as his kids are growing up, um, as he's moving to Montclair, Charles Schultz's career is on the rise. Um, he, he became the director of Hoboken Savings Bank in 1882, president in 1884. In 1890, he asks Michelle Lebrun to design the new Hoboken Bank for Savings. Uh, he likes it so much um, that he and Michelle Lebrun become quite close friends. 
1892, Walter takes over the masonry supply business. He changed the name to Charles S. Schultz and Son. Um, and Charles is really at the pinnacle of his career at this point. So he did what he did during the day to make money, he, uh, Molly tells us, but he had avocations that he thought that's what you do at night. And, um, you know, I guess if you don't have emails to attend to and things like that, it might have been a lot easier to do that. But his favorites when science were microscopy, electricity, astronomy, physics, and geology. And he also absolutely loved to travel. And he went all over the world, literally took a world tour at one point, um, spending his warmer months in the South, in Florida, Bermuda, and Mexico, because that tuberculosis had developed into um, sort of a, a, a problem for him because every winter he would get a really bad bronchial infection and felt that it was better to be away. Uh, interestingly, he went away uh, to the, his trip to Spain was during um, right before the Spanish-American War. And so he decided that he would carry around a German Spanish dictionary. So people thought he was from Berlin as opposed to from the United States. So he builds this house at the pinnacle, pinnacle of his career. And this was truly his home more than Lucy's. Remember, Lucy is sort of reclusive at this point. She's also tired from life, according to Emily. Both her mother and grandmother had died when she was 40, when they were 45 years old. She figured that would happen to her. And according to Emily, she lived the last 15 years of her life in protest. Uh, she didn't want to leave Hoboken. So she said to Charles and Michelle Lebrun, you guys design this. Um, and uh, she, when it was time for them to decorate the house, um, Charles and Emily, his daughter, took care of the decor and furnishings because Walter had become ill and Lucy was nursing him back to health. Uh, building was started in 1894. It didn't finish until 1896. And interestingly, they moved in on July 16, 1896, exactly, almost exactly 125 years ago today. Now, poor, poor Lucy's having more problems. After she moves into Montclair, a child hits Lucy with her bicycle. Um, and her nerves never recovered. She had fainting spells. She never left the house. She became increasingly deaf. The only person she allowed to visit was Dr. Amory Howe Bradford. Um, and in 1905, she develops a severe pain. It turns out it's appendicitis. Her, it had ruptured. Um, they tried to do an emergency operation at home, but she died a few days later with the words, oh, why should it take so much pain for one old woman to die? Um, that was in 1905 and she was a whopping 60 years old. We now have Charles living in the house with his three children, all of whom are in their 20s and 30s. And at this point, um, uh, right after she died, none of them were married. So now we're gonna go down to the final generation. Um, and it truly is the final generation because none of them had offspring. Um, we're gonna start with Charles or he was known as Chucky. Um, and uh, he married a young woman named Isabel Caroline Weeks, who lived basically half a block down on South Mountain Avenue, so very close. She didn't like Isabel, so she always went by Caroline. Um, unfortunately, he died young. He was only 35 years old when he died. Um, Caroline apparently uh, moved to Sitka, Alaska after that to be with her brother-in-law and sister wound up marrying a fisherman there and stayed in Alaska for the rest of her life. Marion is Molly Schultz, whom uh, some of us still may know and remember. Florence or Ponce had had a tough time delivering Molly and nearly lost her life and her baby daughter's life. Um, when the new mom was still in bed, the nurse basically took the baby to Immaculate Conception with the Schultz clan and the LeBrun clan in tow and they baptized her. Um, Michelle Lebrun was her godfather and her godmother was Aunt Mamie O'Neill, who was down in Charleston. Apparently they put her in a bedroom on the, the north room, which I believe is the bedroom on the, um, next to the driveway, uh, with a trained nurse and fed her on whey until she began to gain weight. But she was early on a classic failure to thrive. She remained pale and thin for many years, and it wasn't until she was seven years old when she went to Vineyard Haven where she began to round out. Um, she spent her school year at Kimberly School in Montclair, her summers then after she was 11 at Mars Hill Camp in Union, Maine. Loved it there, camper, junior counselor, counselor, and then as an, um, as an adult woman, she actually bought a small camp in uh, Union, Maine and went there during the summer months as well. 
she went to Smith College. After graduating there, she traveled to California and Hawaii, the only time she ever left Evergreens other than going to school. She got her master's at Radcliffe College, joined the Walden Book Publishing Company, and then ultimately took over the family business. <clears throat> and then we get into what we call, what Emily calls the downgrade. Uh, Charles's trip to Mexico had proved disastrous, both in the short term and the long term. On the way back, he detoured to California, um, wound up in a snowstorm. He became so sick, he nearly died. Then after furnishing the new home, he'd been impressed by the natural resources of the region. So he invested all of his remaining money in bonds for the state of Jalisco, Mexico. And as Emily says, little did he dream that successive revolutions would render all Mexican bonds worthless as a 10 year old hat. He also got involved with a woman named, a uh, German woman named Mrs. Bauman. We don't know her first name but she uh, had a scheme to make slot machines, which never really worked out, but it resulted in Charles buying a, uh, building a factory for her um, and convincing Clifford to give up the bond business and go into helping make slot machines because of his um, unusual mechanical ability. Uh, but he got there too late. So ultimately the slot machine idea was abandoned and Clifford used the space um, to uh, construct models for inventors and other special machinery, but that wasn't making money either. And so someone offered to the buy the factory. And so he basically said, have at it. And he walked away. Business went from bad to worse. They tried to expand the brick business, but it coincided with World War I when nobody was building anything. Charles was determined to keep everybody on payroll. So money was going out, but not coming back in. And at the close of the war, the place they had rented the dock um, in Hoboken, um, after 40 years, basically evicted them because they'd gotten a better offer from a cruise line. So one day he wakes up feeling badly. Um, he claimed it was thinking about his wife who died exactly 19 years earlier to the day, but he never made it to the office that day, um, dying uh, exactly 19 years later in 1924. I wish I could say things turned for the better after that, but they didn't. Uh, the crash in 1929 was the final blow. Um, at one point, they even thought about subdividing the property along Claremont Avenue and North Mountain to just small building lots. Emily doesn't mention this in her family history, but we did find a sketch delineating the potential lots um, in our archives. So of all the businesses and ventures, only the building supply company continued. And in time, Molly ran it until 1977 uh, when they sold it. And she often had people come in and not believe that she was the boss because she was a woman. So you go, Molly. So now we're going to talk briefly, uh, or we're going to show you some pictures of the house. Um, I've got some ones from the past, and I've got one from the future. So we'll go through the ones from the past first. They were all done between 1897 and about 1910. Um, and then we'll look at some new ones that were done in 1915. So just as a point, uh, so you can see it, this was from the 1906 Atlas. And you can see the driveway was different. You see it went, today it kind of goes like this more, but back then it went right in front of the house. There was another uh, road that led you to the carriage house. So your horses and carriage could go straight up there if they weren't dropping anybody off. But if they were dropping somebody off, they could stop there or there by the stairs and then wind their way back around and go to the carriage house. This is the property that Walter built. And as you can see, this is, uh, wasn't developed, but those are all houses now. This is that driveway. You can see it going up here and then curving along and going in. I don't know who this is, but I'm pretty darn sure there's a dog in that picture. Uh, this is the house, an early picture of the house looking very much like it did does today. This is the front hall. It was known as a living hall because it was actually a place where you could um, stop and uh, live there. You know, you could you could spend some time there. Wicker furniture, by the way, was considered helpful and was often in that space. This is the music room, um, also a front parlor or a reception room. You can see this picture over here is a George Innes painting. Um, this is Charles's library where he spent a lot of his time at night tinkering. Um, Ulysses Dietz, who was the former um, head of the Newark Museum, once referred to this as his internet because today we can Google but back then you had to explore for yourself. So he had all sorts of machinery and equipment and books um, that he could do that exploration. 
This was the master bedroom. And this was Emily's sitting room. Emily uh, actually had a little ensuite. I'll, I'll show you in a modern picture uh, her bedroom. This was her sitting room. So visitors would start on the third floor. They would go to the sitting room um, of Walter of Clifford and Florence, and then come down and visit Emily in this sitting room, and then go down to the first floor and visit um, Charles. Now, the cool part of this house is you can climb up through the attic and onto the roof. And this is a view from the roof looking to the east. Um, that house is still there, but the tower is long gone. And then now we just turn a little bit to our right, and now we're looking to the southeast. Um, and that is the Manhattan skyline over there. These pictures were taken by photographer Ann Ruthman back in 2015. There's your front porch. You can see this is actually a, um, it no longer does, but you used to be able to years ago, open that up and it would provide light into your parlor, your living room. Front entrance. And this is that living hall that we saw before. Absolutely beautiful woodwork throughout this first floor of the house. Um, You'll notice all of the fixtures are both gas and electric. And uh, part of that was because when the house was built, they didn't quite trust the electricity, but also uh, they loved the warm glow of the gas. And supposedly Molly kept those, um, kept the gas running up until she bequeathed the house to us in 1996 um, and often put them on during Christmas time because she, she liked them so much more. I can't tell you how many years I was going to this house before I finally realized that there was this forged lion in the back of this fireplace um, that never noticed it until the photographer came back with some, some lighting on it. But the details in this house are just absolutely remarkable. Uh, this is that music room that we talked about, although Molly swears that nobody in her family was musical at all, um, but nonetheless, they had a music room. And that George Innes painting that was over there is now um, at the Montclair Art Museum uh, on loan, long-term loan. So it's nice and safely ensconced there. So if you'd like to go see it, it is on display. This is another view of it. One of the reasons I love this room is because of this bird's eye maple. Um, it is, um, this room has a lighter, more feminine touch than um, any of the other rooms on the first floor, but that bird's eye maple is particular spe particularly spectacular. Just some of the details you can see here. This is all in the music room. This is the fireplace. Uh, now we're walking into the front parlor. Uh, that's the living room. And Emily says that when, or Molly said that when she was young, she knew that she could be louder on the third floor and a little bit quieter on the second floor. But when she got to uh, grandpa's study, she knew she had to mind her P's and Q's. Just some more details on the house, on the woodworking there. I particularly love this lion and he looks great at Christmas time with a little bit of holly stuck in his mouth. Uh, this is Charles's study at the time. Uh, everything from microscopes to uh, souvenirs from his trip around the world, to equipment, to a megalethoscope, to rocks, um, lots and lots of stuff in there. This was the dining room. And you'll see that the fireplace surround has all Delft tiles and um, only two of them match. And apparently it used to be the thing that when you came to dinner was you had to find those two. And Molly would never tell you which one they were. You had to guess. She wasn't gonna let you off easy on that one. Butler's pantry. And then the kitchen. Uh, my favorite, uh, this is an old coast stove. But I suspect that after Charles died in 1924, the women of the house said, yeah, enough of that coal stove. We want something modern. And so they got this little butte and it was uh, around uh, up until Molly was too old and needed some help. And then I think the help said, you know what? I'm not cooking on that stove anymore. And they got something new. Um, the built-ins are remarkable because they still slide as if they were made yesterday uh, in the house. Lots of modern equipment for the time. These are speaking tubes. Um, 
the they had uh, an enunciator, they had a fire suppression system, they had an elevator. Um, this is Molly's bedroom, and uh, this is filled with things like um, her papers from the third grade and other things like that. But when we knew that uh, some of the family was coming, we thought we can't let them see this house like this. And so we picked up the card table, we brought it to another room. But when they walked in, they said, well, where's the card table? So we all picked up the card table and brought it back into the house to, or back into her room together. This was her second room where she lived as an adult. You'll see um, the room where she lived as a child in a moment. This is the master bedroom with beautiful views of Manhattan, I might add. This is the sewing room. Charles felt everything should have its own place. And the best part of the sewing room in my estimation is this um, beautiful cupboard built in. This is what became known as O'Neill blue. Um, that teal color was a favorite of Ponce's or Florence's, uh, at Molly's mother. And you see it popping up throughout the house. This is Emily's sitting room today. Love that fireplace. And this is the bedroom, quote unquote. Um, this would have been her closet. You always know it's a bedroom because it has a sink in it. And this is just enough room to fit about a twin bed in there. And that's about it. Going up the stairs to the third floor, there's your elevator. Uh, oh, before we do though, this is the servant's room on the second floor, not nearly as fancy as the rest of the house, but a place for the servants to hang their hats. This is Molly's room, untouched really since about 19, I would bet, 35 or 40. Um, and she always called it her treehouse room because when you sit in these beautiful little window seats, it really does feel like you're up in a up in a treehouse. This is the sitting room that Florence and Clifford would have stayed in. Uh, the tool room on that floor um, with an absolutely beautiful view of Manhattan. And finally, um, this is the view from the roof today that you will, we need to get back there again in the winter time when you can actually see that other house so we can do a nice comparison between the two. So with that, I will stop my sharing and we have a few minutes for questions and or thoughts from the family members um, if you have anything. So thank you very much. Wanted to help you out with the pronunciation of 43 Legree Street. In Legree. Georgia. Okay, yeah, that's okay. where the O'Neill's live. I'm going to make a note of that this time. Uh, Rob told me this afternoon, and of course, I didn't write it down, and so I promptly forgot. So thank you. I appreciate that. The few times that I visited as a young child, I was fascinated by that fire suppression system, these canvas hoses everywhere, the, in, in closets, but you could see that fire was a big concern. And when I hear about that fire that Hannah survived, it kind of makes me wonder, was there that kind of a connection? The explanation I had been given uh, more recently was that Clifford was in some way connected with a company that did fire suppression or with an insurance company that, that insisted on it because it was such a big, valuable wooden house. But it was interesting to, to hear the story about the fire. And interestingly, um, I have heard a couple of things. I heard that that's one of the reasons they put in the fire suppression system. Um, mm -hmm. I also, um, when I was taking somebody on a tour one time of the house, they laughed and they said, with all the electricity that he was playing with, um, you know, yes, I have a fire suppression system in the house too. Um, one of the things I think I forgot to mention, correct me if I did, um, uh, but after, um, Charles's father, John, died. Um, Hannah and her kids tried to keep their farm going and um, they, were not, they weren't able to. So they wound up selling the house. And very shortly after they sold the house, that house was burned down as well. So it's almost like this fire follows them, you know, in some way. Well, yes and no. I mean, lots of places burned in those days. Right. So fire was a big risk, no matter where you were. And but I wondered if it was because Hannah took her talisman with him, and that's why it burned down. Uh, um, I did notice that, uh, well, he's actually signed off, but Ben uh, Barber was on, and we um, learned that he is, uh, we mentioned a town in Mexico that Charles had visited, and um, it's a town that Ben's been doing some business in, so that was a funny connection. 
Yeah. Uh, ben is, is uh, making tequila. <laughs> I married Thanks. into the family, so my, my memories are pretty thin. And I think I visited the house twice, but we had uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving there. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, getting to know Molly for me was really uh, uh, part of the uh, specialness of the experience. And I have a couple of memories and one that uh, may be false, but I, my memory is that she talked about how Thomas and Edison used to visit her father at the house. <laughs> Now that's interesting because we have been trying to find a connection between Thomas Edison and Charles. Um, and as a matter of fact, we have even asked um, the Edison uh, uh, Historic Park to look through, they have a digitized record of everybody who visited Edison um, and Charles's name was not on it. So it's interesting that that's the first we've had actually had any confirmation of it. So thank you. Well, maybe, maybe Thomas Charles. Edison only came to, to Charles's maybe. house. Maybe. They didn't go the other way. Maybe. They both had know. scopes. So they had a lot of the same interests. Yep. So my, other, my other memory is uh, Molly herself and how um, programmed she was to live in that house. So uh, we had the pleasure of helping her decorate the Christmas tree, which uh, I, and I'm kind of wondering what happened to the ornaments and so forth, oh, but yeah. the tree was on a uh, rotating platform, so it couldn't have lights, but it had lots of things that sparkled and spangled and uh, it had light shining on it. But what I remember is uh, she would open these boxes of ornaments and she knew exactly where everyone went and there was an order in which they had to go up on the platform around the tree. It was amazing because I made the mistake of picking up the one called Japanese by her, which was a Japanese woman figurine of some age. And I put it out too soon and in the wrong place. And we had to redo things as a wow. result. Um, you'll be happy to know that all of the Christmas ornaments and everything else went off with the Barber family. So talk to them because we didn't keep any of them. We gave them all to, to you guys. So um, the Barber family. fight amongst yourselves. We're not getting involved in that one. So when we've heard how special Christmas was um, for the, the Barbers to be with Molly, we said, you, you have to take the decorations. And then we came to learn that the toys had also a lot of significance at Christmas. There were a lot of toys that only came out at Christmas. We, we heard also from neighbors and residents of Montclair who were invited at Christmas time. And um, so we used to have some of those on display and things. And so, um, you know, that was part of what we really wanted the family to take. Well, a lot of what we have is memories, not just, um, I have very, very few, if any, artifacts from there, but I have rich memories. When we came, my family was stationed in Germany and came back to visit sort of on, we visited on our way to the next station. And our grandmother was living at that time in that other house up the hill from Molly's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we visited him a couple of times, stayed there for a few days. But one of my early memories is going down to the big house and the old ladies would be sitting in rocking chairs on the porch. And one of them was Emily. And there were several other old ladies that were sitting in these rocking chairs on the porch. And much younger. Hans, I believe. And our grandmother was much younger than Hans. But in any event, the striking, these things that you would see as a seven-year-old girl um, for, that you would never imagine seeing before, like that kind of an elevator that went up through the center of the house or the stairs winding around it with window benches on it. I used to have dreams about those window benches. Mm -hmm. And of course, all of the uh, fascinating little objects in Clifford's library. And my father, um, spent a summer there when he was in high school or just out of high school. Um, he was, I think, working in some kind of a job in the city. He was maybe 16 or 17. And he used to tell us lots of stories about Clifford and Ponce and the evenings in their sitting room and the, 
Victrola, and I think the summer he was there, Molly was not there. And, but he had his bedroom on the second floor and he you know, had many, many stories to tell. Was, one, of, one of the stories that I love was um, when uh, we were bringing, we were with one of the family members. I, I think it may have been Rob, but I'm not positive. Um, on the third floor in that sitting room. And he he said, you know, I remember Clifford always used to go over there to get his tobacco. And he pointed up to um, above the secretary desk. And sure enough, the tobacco was still up there. So, um, you know, it's it that that room in particular was a was a cool room. So, yeah. That family did even changing things. They they believe very strongly in keeping things as they had always been. Yep. Yep. And that was part of the charm and also the overwhelmingness of it. It's really wonderful to know that it's going to be in the hands of, of people who will occupy it and who will preserve it. Houses like that need to be lived in. And they need to be loved. And I really believe that this family does love it to pieces, just the way we do. So we're delighted. Someone asked if the house was haunted, and, and I'll let you answer that one. Not exactly haunted, but in a much more benevolent way. <laughs> um, well, I, you know, I think a lot of it depends on what you believe. Um, I can tell you some pretty strange stories about the house. Um, um, one of my favorites is that the house had been closed up over the winter and um, um, there was a um, string that started in Molly's room with the card table that went all the way down the hallway hooking over hinges and all the way down to the elevator when we reopened it in the spring and nobody was in the house all winter long so how did that string get to be and then my daughter um, was on the third floor with me one time when she was about 14 years old. And um, she's texting away and I kept saying, Molly's not gonna be happy that you're texting away. And uh, got to the third floor and all of a sudden her phone stopped working. And I said, see, Molly was mad at you. And uh, you know, we got out, she's taking the battery out when you could do that and putting it back in, nothing's working. We get downstairs, get in the car, phone goes right back on. So, you know, is that coincidence? Is it haunted? Who knows? But I think that I think that they are truly um, loving people, even if they are haunted there. What other questions do we have, Helen? Um, somebody asked about um, the easements. They are in perpetuity. There is no end limit to them. Um, somebody asked about the, um, will the new owners keep some of the original built-ins? Absolutely. Um, they're as enamored with the details of the house as we are, as, as you are. And so, um, you know, we, ex we expect that they will keep many, many, many of those details. And we also, um, they are keeping some of the uh, pieces of furniture that are most, mm -hmm. if you will, indigenous to the house. So, um, yeah. Briefly, do you know anything about the servants, Jane? I know you do. I know we've had some senses. I do. Um, and actually, I had just run out of time. I have a slide about the servants that I canned last night because of it. But um, the um, there were initially just two uh, cooks there. There was a cook and, and a house cleaner, basically. And then they wound up instead hiring a woman named Johnny Johnson, who was Swedish, and she was there until about World War I ended and then wanted to go back to Sweden, so she left. But then they had, uh, starting around 1900, they had John Carroll and his wife Elizabeth and their two children who lived in the carriage house. He was their chauffeur. Um, I assume Elizabeth helped as well, but remember by mid 19 early 1920s that's when things began to get tough and so I don't really see a record of servants post uh 1929. Jane it's Rob Barber I'm just uh I, I'm gonna say thank you very much for this wonderful and lively presentation uh, uh all of the things that you said about the O'Neill side of the family which is which is where I'm related to Molly and and Florence Punch were right on right on the money. But thank, thank you. you so much. And we've uh, gotten to know Rob pretty well. We appreciate um, all your input into the to the history of the family too as well, Rob. Thank you.
Well, it's, it's been a pleasure and, and I, I speak for many more than just myself with uh, appreciation for your stewardship and delight that you found a family who will be acquiring and living in this house. It's just terrific, thanks. Thanks, that means so much to us, Rob. One of my favorite stories that I heard, two favorite stories for the Barbers when they when we spent a few days with them at the house. Um, one, when your oldest son was there and, and your wife said, oh, when you were a baby, you were in the master bedroom where you guys slept when you came to visit. She said, when, when um, um, Alex is your oldest son, correct? Uh, Nick is the oldest. Nick, Nick. when but... Nick was a baby and you, and um, they would pull out a drawer from the built-in dresser and they would just fix that up. So that's where Nick would sleep when he was a, a tiny baby. But the other funny thing was when your boys, um, all three of your boys came to the house and, um, and, you know, we were just walking around and they were looking into the music room and I was like, you know, please, you know, go freely wherever you want. And they're like, really? Because we could never come in this room. <laughs> that's true. It, every... Uh, every infant visiting that house uh, had a had an opportunity to sleep in one of those large drawers from the master bedroom uh, set. Yeah. Of course, we had the grown young man climb into the drawer so we could take a picture, <laughs> um, you know, just last year. So yeah. <laughs> just to prove it. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Jane, can I just have Charles Hyer explain his connection? I see sure. Charles is there. Yes, hi, I think I'm unmuted, yes. Um, Charles Schultz, the, I believe it's a grandson who died in 1945. Um, he was my father's business partner. They formed a company called Hire Schultz, and uh, which I eventually was running in the uh, 60s and 70s. But um, he, was, uh, he was known as Chucky, was, uh, I know him as Chucky Schultz. Uh, he married Caroline. Uh, she apparently didn't like the name Isabel, so she went by Caroline. She was my mother's best friend. Um, and um, he did, she did go to Sitka, Alaska. She married a, uh, a local named Sam Singh. Um, so I, I, I do have pictures of Chucky, so I should stop down to uh, 108 and bring the information I have because you can tie some more, more things together. I would love to have that. You know, it's funny because when I was looking for the pictures of the three kids, Emily, Walter, and Clifford, there are, you know, eight pictures of uh, even the same way it is today, right? There are eight pictures of Emily, the firstborn as a baby. Then you get down to Walter and there are, you know, maybe three or four. And then you get to Clifford and it's like, there's one. There's an obligatory picture and that's it. So uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'd love yeah. to have more pictures if we can. Yeah, in fact, I, I was named after him. I was supposed to be Philip. And I was born in 45, right after he died. And so they ah. changed and I became Charles. Wow, <laughs> wow, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, I'll, I'll contact you and, and come down to the building. Great, thanks a lot. Jane, Jane, this is, yeah. this is the Casco Public Library, but I'm actually Mary Grace Barber. I'm Peter's wife. Hi. And Peter, hi, Peter loved so much to help Molly with the well. I'm wondering, can you talk about the well? Is it working? Are the bottles still around? Or? <laughs> the, the old Gallo wine bottles? Um, I think they were Almaden. Almaden, okay. I knew they were one or the other, but yes. So the well was right outside. I believe it was working up until Molly's death. So, um, I, you know, we as a, as a museum space had to seal it up, you know, uh, so that people couldn't accidentally fall into it. So. Um, but I would assume that it probably is still working. And from what I understand, um, and Peter, um, and my condolences on his passing, but Peter would talk about how he would go out to the well. Molly, Molly would always have people come out to the oh, well and on. fill up the water in just a certain way. Um, I know Rob has told me about how there were certain ways that you had to fill that water and carry it in without them clinking. And, and, um, she much preferred that water to the city water. And she also said that after Mountainside Hospital put its addition on back, God knows when, um, the water table did dry up a bit, she found, that it was harder to get water out of the well than it had been previously. Yeah. Well, thanks. Um, it, they're, they're fond memories. All right, well, thank you all. If that's uh, all we have, then uh, I appreciate uh, your coming on today. 
This will be put up on YouTube in the next couple of weeks. Uh, if you haven't looked at some of our other programs there and you're interested, do take a look at some of the other things we've got. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, and if you have other personal stories that you'd like to make sure are not lost to the ages, you know, certainly write them down and send them to me or give me a call and we can arrange a Zoom call and um, I can, you know, record it so that you can become part of the archives as well. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thanks Take especially care. to the family Thank members you. who came yes, today. Especially, yes, thank you.